Let's do it. All right, here we go. Uh, welcome everybody to the Fast Pitch, Fast Pitch Zone question and answer session with Rick and Sarah Pauly. Sarah is a former All-American at Texas A&M and Cor Corpus Christi and an eight-time All-Pro player in the NPF, um, eight-time eight, eight NPF All-Pro team player, I should say, and also a most valuable pitcher in 2006. In 2007, she was also on the U.S. national team. Sarah has pitched and coached in tournaments, leagues around the world, including Japan and Italy, and recently retired after 18 years of pro softball and now lives in Austin, Texas. Rick, owner of Poly Girl Fast Pitch and High Performance Pitching. He is a nationally known pitching coach and has worked at various colleges, including University of Georgia, University of South Carolina, and many others. Rick also used to play and pitch in men's fast pitch open leagues. He now has an online training program for players, parents, and certifications for pitching coaches as well. I'm Jesse Rosenon, owner of Elite Sports Training and a private pitching coach out of Buffalo, New York. Um, to start off, Sarah, can you give us a brief background on how you grew up playing softball? Uh, like how, how, did how did I start? Sure. Um, well, I didn't really have a choice. <laughs> um obviously my dad played men's fast pitch um and he was very passionate about softball and pitching and kind of just the way that I remember it is that one of the days when I was done with school and he came home from work he said hey let's go pitch in the backyard and so that was kind of our routine until I hit about call it or sorry until I hit about high school um, and we would practice every single night after school after he was done with work um, either in the backyard or at our high school field um, and one thing led to another he ended up coaching me in travel ball um, you know ended up going to college still coaching me, still coaching me to this day, even though I just retired. <laughs> oh, she, got, she got a lot to learn yet, Jess. Um, so yeah, uh, just, I just kind of started because it was his passion and I'm really thankful that it was his passion because it, it turned into mine as well, so. Awesome. And, and Rick, how did you get started into pitching lessons? Into pitching lessons, oh goodness sakes, uh, quite a while ago, um, I kind of like a lot of people got into it. Uh, the local high school needed some help. And there was a girl and I knew her parents and they said, hey, you used to pitch, could you help her? So I started helping her. And then all of a sudden I'm helping another kid and then another kid. And uh, it just, it kind of blossomed from there. Uh, this was actually when I lived in Wisconsin, I started it. And then, you know, we moved to Phoenix, kind of got into the fast pitch scene in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, did uh, pitching coaching for a couple high schools there, uh, pitching coach for um, Sarah's travel ball team, the Little Saints, and uh, just kind of kept growing and growing and growing. And next thing I knew, I was a college pitching coach. So... Uh, that's a, that's the short version. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so what we did is we asked the members of the fast pitch zone to submit some questions. Um, and they, they gave us a bunch and we're going to start with some background type questions first, and then we're going to have, um, Rick and Sarah kind of go over. We, we asked them to submit videos and somebody submitted a video that we'll actually do a little video analysis on. And then after we do that, um, we're going to go into more detailed questions about pitching mechanics after that. Um, so here are some of the questions from our members. The first one, um, this was towards Rick. As a former men's player um, that played at an elite level, what was it like being a bucket dead for Sarah? Well, um, of course, it was great. Uh, but here's what I would tell you. I always kind of go back in the day because my day is quite a ways back. If Back in the day, if somebody had told me that girls could pitch the way that girls pitch now, I, I would have said, not a chance. But these young ladies can really throw a ball. And it's, you know, 
for anybody that hasn't ever seen girls fast pitch, the first time they see a girl throw a ball, they are mesmerized. And, and I kind of got mesmerized too. Okay. Um, you know, I, I will tell you this, um, when Sarah started out and close your ears, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but Sarah was not, uh, a natural pitcher. Uh, she started it's when she was 11. Good. Yeah. <laughs> she started when she was 11, uh, in the backyard. And, uh, I, I sort of kind of had to really stretch the truth sometimes, like when she would launch a ball over our fence into the neighbor's pool, I'd tell her it was a great rise ball, <laughs> you know, and, when the dog ran across and she hit the dog one time, says that dog on good pitch. So um, really, um, yeah, I think um, I'm going to give myself credit. I think some people might have said, uh, maybe this young lady needs to find another sport. Well, luckily she didn't and she persevered. And I will tell you this, um, I had no idea there was such a fierce competitor wrapped up in my little girl. And when she's in a game, she is a competitor, okay? And uh, I guess what I would say is this, this whole journey from 11-year-old till, I'm not even going to say how old she is now, Jesse, okay? But many, many, many years later, I uh, wouldn't trade it for anything, okay? And all the bucket dads out there and the bucket moms, uh, I think uh, you sort of know what I mean already, but you will really, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, when your daughter does leave the game, it's like, oh, somebody just ripped, you know, something out of your heart and took it with them. So anyhow, that's uh, that's kind of it. So now now that we've already heard about Rick saying how bad Sarah was, Sarah, how <laughs> having your dad as a as a pitching coach is awesome. What was the biggest blessing from that and what was the biggest pitfall and how did you both navigate it? <laughs> so. Um, I'm not going to lie. It was very difficult in the beginning. Um, I did not listen to him. I didn't want to think that he was right. Uh, I didn't want, um, it, it was hard to take, uh, critique and criticism from my dad. And I uh, definitely didn't want to disappoint him because I knew that um, I would see him every day, you know? So if I didn't do what uh, he had asked of me as a pitcher, then I felt maybe that it was going to affect our family life. Um, so he's, he was really smart because he, I, I say this now, he's, he has a little grin on his face. Um, he actually took me to see another pitching coach and the guy's name is Ron Bolden. Um, he was a retired pitching coach for the university of Arizona and he was really great. And come to find out he was really great because my dad was telling him what to tell me and <laughs> how to coach me. And he was, he was a great pitching coach otherwise, but um, it took me a while before I realized that my dad was telling me the same things that my pitching coach was telling me. And once I finally, you know, got over that barrier, um, Probably whenever I went to college, um, you know, we kind of stopped seeing Ron and he, my dad turned into the full-time pitching coach instead of just part-time, you know? Um, so I think that was the most difficult challenge starting up as, um, and becoming a pitcher in the beginning, um, the, the blessing is what we've created, um, you know, s since, you know, uh, since I put my trust in him as my coach, um, just y it, having the same passion, uh, being able to um, 
bond over the same passion and uh i i i don't think you know i wouldn't trade it for the world it's it's really great it really um it really helped when i figured out that he knew what he was talking about you know so really on that point going back if you're 10 again what would you do if anything would what, what would you do different yeah so i i actually didn't start pitching or playing softball until I was 11. But um, it, yeah, I know whenever I saw that, I was like, well, nothing. But still, my answer is nothing because I wouldn't have been able to create this softball life. Um, I don't think any better than how I feel my experiences and my journey has been. Um, I don't really, I'm not really the type of person that, that really likes to, um, have any regrets. Um, so whenever I saw that question, it, like just in a heartbeat, I knew, well, really there's nothing that I would have changed, you know, because it got me to where I am today. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, this question was for Rick. What was your favorite coaching job? Well, <clears throat> I've had a lot of coaching jobs, okay? I loved them all. Uh, I really did. I mean, I've been to quite a few different colleges and uh, travel ball in high school and stuff like that. But if I said the job I like the most, it's when I coached my first college coaching job, Spartanburg Methodist Junior College. And the reason being is when you're a junior college head coach, you are the chief cook and bottle washer. You're the, you're the head coach, you're the pitching coach, you're the hitting coach, you're the defensive coach, you're the academic advisor, you're the grounds crew, you're the strength and conditioning coach. So you learn how to run a program. Okay, so my hat's off to all of you JUCO coaches and quite a few you coaches, uh, you know, let's say in the D3 or D2 two levels that don't have great big massive budgets like maybe the, you know, the Alabamas and Floridas of the world have. Um, my hat's off to you, okay? And, and I know how hard you work, okay? It's, a, it's not an eight-hour-a-day job. Uh, it's about a 20-hour-a-day job, and it's probably – a cash outflow instead of a cash inflow. So anyhow, uh, 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 junior college, that's for me. Sarah, how is softball training in, in Japan different? It's night and day. Um, practices are a lot longer in Japan, six plus hours a day. Um, and that's just during the week. I know. Um, if, if, if you're not playing games on the weekend, then you go to practice in the morning and 8 a.m. and you practice all day long until the sun goes down. You have one hour break for lunch. And really, it's not even a realistic break because us foreigners would think a one hour break really meant you get to take a break for an hour eat your lunch, just relax. But immediately after lunch was consumed for my Japanese teammates, they were up and at them and they were doing something extra because anything that they wanted to do that was con not considered um, in the practice plan or that was an extra um, for them as an individual, had to be done outside of the all day practice. So if we're practicing all day long, like I said, until the sun goes down, after we ha would have a meeting and everyone would say goodbye, they would turn the lights on and stay even longer to work on their individual work. So, um, the, the practice, the, um, there's not much individual um, time, as I was saying, it's, it's very team-based. Um, 
I guess during practice, the only thing that would be somewhat individualized would be a, a bullpen. Uh, but then it's not, it's not like I would go and just throw a bullpen with my catcher. No, um, there would be another Japanese uh, pitcher next to me with her catcher and they would want to make sure that we were discussing pitches, um, game plans, batters, um, what to throw in what situations. So there was always that team emphasis, uh, no matter what we did. Um, conditioning was a huge aspect of practices. Uh, you know, there's a saying, um, you hear it all the time in the States, uh, you know, no, no walking on the field. And, and then, and then there's still those kids that kind of walk sometimes. Well, in Japan, there really is no walking. So if, if the team was taking BP, for example, and um, we were getting ready to clean up the balls and put the balls in the baskets, as you were coming in from putting the balls in the baskets, you would be running in with two possible baskets in your arms, you know, because you can't waste a single second if you're walking. And so I think that's one of the biggest differences um, that I noticed um, between playing ball in the States versus playing ball in Japan. It seems like more lax in the States and more discipline in Japan. And I, I feel yeah. like we saw that at the Olympics. Like, yes. how, I mean, I've seen Japan play before and how disciplined they were on and off the field. And you could see like their defense was very precise. Yeah. They were very quick to make moves. Um, yeah. And it probably is all from all that, everything they do in that training, just like that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the... You hear about the, the Asian athletes um, starting training very, very young, um, like five, six years old, um, and just continually training their entire life for, you know, one game. And so that's, yeah, maybe six or seven-year-olds, they do start you know, playing coach pitch here in the States, but they are not training the same as those Asian athletes are, you know, they don't, they don't go train before they go to school in the morning. You know, they don't, um, it doesn't completely consume them. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sarah, what, what was your favorite place to play softball? Okay, so I'm torn with this question because um, as far as like competitiveness and um, being held accountable in a strict manner, I would say Japan. But as far as just letting loose and having fun and playing the game that you grew up loving as a kid, I would say Italy. Um, you know, the, the, there's a huge difference between playing ball in Italy versus playing ball in Japan. You know, um, I just kind of gave you the rundown of Japan, but just to kind of touch on Italy, you know, we would practice maybe two or three times a week, uh, maybe for two, three hours at the most. And three hours was a lot, you know, um, after practice, you know, you would get together and have dinner and drinks together and just really um, try and create that like family bond. Uh, so uh, that would be one, um, one thing that's this, the same, you know, yeah. the, the whole team aspect of the game. It seems like, it seems like two different, completely different cultures, which yes. you could you could definitely see like Italy is about eating and drinking and, and family culture. And Japan has like more of that discipline work, work ethic culture. 
Yeah. Um, the work ethic is still there in Italy. It's, um, it's just, it's, it's just fun, you know, like you can go out there and have fun and win ball games, you know, and there's not, it doesn't feel like there's much pressure, you know, you just can relax. And then it'll, and then Japan is just really cutthroat and you can have fun, but it's kind of frowned down upon, um, to show, uh, an emotion of, of that sort, I guess you'd say. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to move on to a question for Rick. Rick, name one student who made you a better pitching coach. Well, <clears throat> this one's loaded because I know who this one came from. Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to say just about every student makes you a better pitching coach. I, I don't think there's two students I've had that are ever identical, the same, that didn't stretch your imagination somehow, like, how am I going to help this kid or this kid or this kid or whatever. But there is one in particular. Uh, her name is Emerson Aiken. Oh, and, I thought you were going to say Sarah Pauly. Uh, well, well, I'm not I done with you yet. Sarah too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Emerson and I and her mother would joke a lot about, you know what? I would tell her, you're making me a better pitching coach because Emerson was one of these kids that, you know, she was like a balloon. If you pushed on this side of the balloon, something popped out over here. And then you'd have to push this one back in and something popped out over here. And it was just a nonstop push and pop with, uh, with M. Uh, she turned out okay, though, because um, I just saw her uh, reel today on Instagram. She was doing her move-in party with the University of Michigan uh, teammates of hers. So uh, she's doing okay. Um, but here would be one tip I would give to every pitching coach out there or parent. Uh, be careful with the instruction you give to your kid. If you have a kid that's an overachiever, the kid will probably overachieve on, let's say, on the corrective instruction you gave. They come back the next lesson, you got to correct them the other direction. So just be aware of that. Some kids are so driven that uh, it's a constant back and forth on the corrections. Okay, but anyhow, so good old M, and she's off to uh, college. Um, on that note, Rick, who is your biggest influence when it comes to coaching and pitching? Yeah, uh, they're two different people. Uh, if I just said coaching, probably the biggest influence would be uh, Lou Harris Champer, head coach of University of Georgia when I coached there. Uh, Lou, first of all, is an amazing person. And secondly, uh, it just blew my mind that somebody that was one of the very top coaches in the United States, been at it for a long time, still had the passion she had. If there was something out there in the softball world, some new training, some new technique, some new mechanic, and if she didn't know about it, she was going to find out about it. She was the uh, hardest working coach I've ever been around and uh, a pleasure. So the only thing, my only regret is I wish she would have come into my life earlier. It was right at the end of my coaching career when Lou and I got hooked up and uh, I just, I wish it would have been earlier. Okay. Now, if we were just talking pitching coach, Sarah's already mentioned who it is, um, Ron Bolden. You know, like she mentioned, Ron was the retired pitching coach at the University of Arizona. When Arizona had just begun winning all their national championships, he had been the pitching coach. He retired. He was a colonel in the Air Force. Saturday mornings, he would do little clinics in Phoenix, just really informal. That's where I took Sarah. Okay. Uh, but Ron was, uh, first of all, the greatest person in the world. Great coach. Really showed me and everybody there how do you work with kids. He was so positive. And uh, just, he was a great role model, a great mentor. And uh, yeah. I was fortunate Ron came into my life pretty early in, in my coaching career. Awesome. Um, I think we could skip through to the video announce portion of it. Do you, um, Rick, can you 
maybe pull up your screen? Uh, I can, um, let me see. I hit the share down here, I believe. Let's try that, share. And I think yeah. you got my screen here, okay. I'm gonna bring up a little spreadsheet first. Okay, when I do a uh, video assessment, I have a, uh, a little form that I use. You can see it right here on my screen. Uh, it's a checklist and uh, I'm gonna scroll through it. I'm gonna go through this pretty rapid fire. Okay, but it's a 53 point checklist on pitching mechanics. And it's broke down into uh, things related to posture, drive, arm path, rotation, glove path. So you're going to see all these points are color coded when I go through here. Okay. And they have to do with the different aspects of pitching. But when I do a, uh, uh, an assessment, I start right at the beginning. Well, if you look right here, this picture of Sarah, she's standing on the pitching rubber, taking the sign. And that's where I start. Okay. Now each one of these checkpoints gets a rating somewhere between one and five, five being, Hey, really good, man. You don't have anything to work on there as far as I can see. Uh, if you get a one, two, that's usually not very good. A three sometimes is not really good. Okay. But uh, I started out and here's, you know, we're taking a signal. We're doing a nine o'clock backswing. Here are all the different checkpoints that I've done. This particular assessment is actually the second assessment I did on this young lady. Okay, you'll see the little things that are written in red right here. She had something wrong here with her arm backswing or whatever it was here. And I made the note for her, okay? Well, then the second time we did the lesson or a video lesson, a follow-up, and she had gone to work on all this stuff, where you see a red over here, that is an indication that there was a low mark. And so we reviewed it. Here's her new mark. She went from, on this case, I think it was a, a three, she went to a five rating. Oh, she changed her pre-motion instead of a backswing, she started coming out of the glove and it just made such a difference for her, okay? So you can see, we just go down here and fives and fives and ratings and stuff like that. Okay, now we're in the six o'clock, we're in the drive, we're going up to three o'clock. So we're looking at all the checkpoints in, in that phase of the pitch. And you can see this young lady, had some issues, okay, the first time through. The blue ones are the second time through, making a comment on what the issue was. Okay, go down here. Here we are, we're going from two o'clock up to 12 o'clock. And of course, I, I put these pictures of Sarah here, so it's kind of a good visual for the kid when we're doing the assessment. And we just keep rolling along here, and I'm just gonna kind of scroll through here quickly. You know, we're down here to stride foot plant. We got all these checkpoints. Here's all these things that we went over here with the red. Now we're at nine o'clock, 7.30, going on down. Here we're releasing the ball and we're following through and we're done. So 53 checkpoints. And this, we go through every checkpoint with a young lady and we cover good and not so good because it's important for a young lady to hear good. Is that right, Sarah? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I will tell you, I, you come down here, this is a spreadsheet, so it auto totals up a girl's score. Well, if you have 53 points and there's five points potential, you have a potential of scoring 265 points here, okay? This young lady, on her follow-up session that we did, she brought her number up to 238. She was at 200. 200 is not a great score. There's a lot of issues going on. 238 on the other hand is a pretty darn good score. I think the highest score I've had on any kid uh, probably is about a 248, maybe almost 250. I haven't had anybody perfect yet. So here's a key point also is we come down here, the first time we did this assessment, here were the recommended corrections or corrective drills in order of importance, okay? So then over here on this side, here's session two. Here's your new corrective drills in order of importance. Because when you go through 53 points, uh, a young lady and her parents, their heads are spinning and you, you can't expect that young lady to try to correct everything you said in you know one, one month until your next session or whenever it is. So 
you give them an order. Here's most important, second, third, fourth. So that's kind of how the, the sheet goes. It keeps me organized. <clears throat> and I'll give credit to Jesse. Um, a lot of this information, uh, her and I shared, and uh, I sort of kind of plagiarized what she had and added some of my own twist. And so a lot of this is stuff that came from Jesse right here, Jesse Rosenhan. So uh, I appreciate her for that. What's that? I, think I, stole, I, I said, how dare you steal from me? I think I stole yeah. from YouTube. So it works yeah. well, I think you know I have they, your spreadsheet too, Jesse. He sent it to me. Yeah. <laughs> I think okay. I said this to a lot of people. A lot of people are stealing. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do they say? Uh, plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. That's just to make the game better. That's all we're here yeah. for. Yeah. All right. So let me put up um, a little screen share. And uh, I'm going to try to enlarge this view. I think I can. I'm going to go to full screen. All right. So uh, one of our um, people on uh, the website uh volunteered a, a video of his daughter and thank you steve we appreciate that okay i'm going to go through this i mean really really quickly i'm going to point out some good stuff and so maybe some things that she could work on just to give everybody a flavor of you know how do you do an, an online assessment okay so again we're starting her right here uh right at the get-go right at the beginning and i'm going to just kind of move her a little bit She's got a uh, an okay setup here. You know, she's got her feet split about the right distance apart, uh, meaning forward to backward. And uh, she's pretty good. She doesn't have her feet way out here, outside her shoulders. Or she's got a pretty good centering with her foot here. Good stuff. Okay, we're gonna go here. We're gonna watch her start her drive. And uh, we've got a group of people that have kind of been focusing on drive mechanics lately. And I would say that her drive is okay, but she could do some better things. Like this back leg here should actually help her a little bit more than what it does. It's not really uh, springing her out of there really rapidly. Okay, and I'm gonna take her right to here and I stop. You can see I've already got some lines drawn here. So she's got a really good thing in that if I drew another line, um, well, if I just went from her knee straight down, you'd see her knee is engaged. It's about two or three inches in front of her toe. That's a pretty good knee engagement. We like that. Okay. Now, if I took a line from her toe, connected to her knee and brought it up here, I think what you would see is uh, she never really gets into a great forward lean. She tries to get up too early. She goes vertical too early. So. Uh, I think we're gonna see something on that in just a bit when we get close to her landing posture. Okay, so um, let me just roll this forward a little bit. I guess what I should have said is that line right there says her face ought to be up here on this line that's connected with the knee and the toe. That would be a better lean. Okay, let me just move her forward here a little bit. Uh, she's coming out, okay, this young lady comes out decently as far as she's not really forcing an opening movement, which is, you're gonna hear Sarah talk about that I think a little bit later on. She's doing what we call basically an out of glove pre-motion. Uh, typically on that pre-motion, you come out of the glove at about three o'clock. She comes out a little bit early, but I'll bet she's probably pretty early into this new pre-motion here. So. Uh, doing pretty good. I would encourage people to think about using that pre-motion rather than a uh, backswing. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, one thing I will say a little bit, uh, I'm going to take her up here. If you look, you watch her back foot. See how it comes off and she's kind of got what we call um, a fairy leap. Okay. So technically that would be illegal. Okay, and so the question is, what causes that? There's two or three causes that I find. One is where the stride leg is doing more of the work than the drive leg. This drive leg is not really maybe extending and thrusting her as hard as it could. If so, I think that toe would stay on the ground. And she's kind of uh, just a little bit, there's more of a, a kicking with that stride leg rather than driving it with her knee. 
And there's one other thing that kicks in as she gets right about here, she does go into a little bit of a excessive opening with her hips and shoulders. And that's sometimes a killer, okay? Uh, as far as it'll get you leaping into the air and it becomes a little bit inefficient. So, you know, she could do a little bit better there, I guess you'd say, okay? Uh, now she does a great job when she comes down with her landing foot. You can see she lands at a bit, about a 45 degree. So she's actually gonna get some hip rotation to help her with the rest of her pitch. But I want you to take note of something. Basically her stride foot has landed and I got a little angle meter on her. So she's actually, I, I measure the tilt of the spine and she's at about 170 de degrees, which means she's tilted about 10 degrees behind vertical. Well, I think that's within range of being pretty good. So you can see she's really well aligned here. Her upper and lower torso, great. Uh, her arm right here, the humerus is in a good position at time of foot plant. So she's gonna really transfer energy into this humerus pretty well right here. But I'm gonna go ahead here and I'm gonna stop at something because, or, or move to something. You see this 170, right? I'm gonna take her to release. And she's about at release right now. And you'll see that angle increased. She's actually leaned back four degrees from where she was at landing. And that's to me is just absolutely opposite of what you want. If anything, the upper body should go forward to the point where instead of being 10 degrees behind vertical like she was at stride foot plant, she would be only two to four degrees behind vertical. Okay, she'd be somewhere, I just moved that by hand, she would have been up in that range right there would be more efficient. But almost the last thing you wanna do is to increase your back tilt after you land. Um, not healthy for the lower back. So would I would be say very- she, Would you say she was like trying to resist maybe with her upper body and not with her shin or her leg? Like that she's trying yeah. to hold her shoulder back to keep her weight back rather Probably, than using resistance yeah. through her leg? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and you can see there is a, uh, one other thing you would know, there's a bit of a resistance problem with the stride leg. When it lands, it's gonna, it's collapsing and kind of shifting her forward, okay? But um, the landing is great. It's just, it's after the landing, there's a, there's a, something's telling her to increase that back tilt. And, mm -hmm. and you know, she's tilted back uh, a 14 or 16 degrees when she's letting go of the ball. Okay, and that's too much. I mean, it's gonna be hard to throw a low pitch. Everything's gonna to wanna to go high, okay? So that's uh, something that we always look at um, a little bit, really quick, I'll go back up here. You see the bend in her arm for arm whip. Well, right there, it's beautiful, but you're gonna notice that right there at foot plant, you see how it straightens out. And <clears throat> a little bit, Jess, you know this, and some of the other people on here do, they know about bow flex bow, okay? And this young lady's, especially her pitching arm is almost absolutely in line with her shoulder girdle. You know, her glove arm is back a little bit. If this humerus, like if she would take her elbows back and cause a bit of a stretch across her pec area, uh, I think the bend would stay in her arm, okay? She would uh, probably, uh, fire her, her delts a little bit, would, would give her a little better external rotation, which would keep that arm loaded or bent. So, but I will tell you folks, um, having a bent whipping arm is huge for speed. Way, 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 such way high on the scale if you wanna throw fast. So you gotta do everything you can to keep a bend in the arm. Like for instance, this young lady's arm, I'll just draw on it real quick. You can see where it is right here. Okay, if she had good arm whip, the lower arm would be right there. So that would be basically 135 degrees. And this upper arm would compress on her ribs and then this arm would whip out and it would really accelerate huge, big numbers, okay? So 
Um, she's got, uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of erase some of those little things to get them out of our sight. Um, she's got uh, internal rotation of her humerus is, is doing nice. She's got a decent pronation of her forearm. She's got a, a pretty good brush trigger here, okay? She's probably not getting as much stabilization on her thigh as she could with her forearm. And that probably is number one related to the fact her hips and shoulders have, uh, in my opinion, have rotated too far in the closing movement at time of release, okay? So uh, the, the stability or resistance, two things. She needs to resist this leg here collapsing, okay? And she needs to resist these hips and shoulders rotating quite so much, so. But anyhow, um, she, she's got a lot of good things going. She's got some good instructors helping her. Uh, my guess is she'll be in pretty good shape uh, in not too distant future. So that's a real quick look at, you know, what we do. I probably covered, uh, you know, 20 of the 53 points here, but. <laughs> um, yeah, you still touch base on enough. And I think you touch base on probably the most important parts. And really that's what, I, you know, they need to tackle first is, is what you mentioned, the resistance of the front leg and the shoulders. And that will help her um, posture stand up right, right? Instead of being backwards yes. as much. Yes. Yeah, awesome. yeah. And, okay. and a quick shout out. I know uh, I looked on the uh, website and Josh Levine uh, had posted a little picture of his really, really, really young daughter. He said, but this isn't, isn't for, um, you know, the assessment tonight. But I would want to shout out to you and say, you know what? Your kid's got the number one thing going that you need. Her posture is pretty darn good already, and she is not forcing an opening. So you folks go back and look at that picture that's on the website, and uh, this kid's off to a pretty good start. Uh, congrats, Carrie Hand. I think she's one of our certified coaches down in Texas, doing a good job there. Awesome. Is that okay, on I'll your uh, Twitter or Instagram, or where was that? Uh, it was on – it was on um, – on, on this website that we're talking about here, the uh, fast oh, the, the fast pitch zone, the yeah, okay. the fast yeah. pitch zone. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, so just, we're going to go on. I'm sorry, what did you say? No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. We're going to go on and, and ask you guys some more technical questions now that we kind of reviewed a little uh, analysis on a pitcher and gone over some mechanics. Um, this one is for Sarah. What commonly taught mechanics do you see that are inefficient or counterproductive? Okay, so there's three major um, mechanics that I see almost all of the time if I get a new student. And um, I can actually show these if that will help because the terminology some people might not really know or understand. But um, the first one would be hello elbow. Um, so, um, obviously there's, you know, two, two ways to kind of teach pitching. I don't, I don't know. We, we don't, we don't really teach hello elbow, but I do know that, um, a lot of people do teach it because it, it maybe was like the old school way of teaching. Um, or those people maybe have never seen high speed video before. So, um, you know, they're, they're teaching um, a movement that they think is happening, but really isn't. Um, and that would be just kind of like a follow through that just kind of just um, has you like pushing the ball. So it would be here like a here motion. Um, and so, sorry, that was kind of odd. Um, I'm, try I'm trying to figure out like where I can stand to where you could probably see a full motion. We saw that, that was okay. Okay, so, um, and the gist behind that the term is hello elbow is where, you know, you, you pull up and like you're waving hello with your elbow. Um, and so that would be the first one. Um, 
something that kind of goes along with Hello Abba would be um, wrist flicks or wrist like snaps. You go up super close to the catcher and you just start like doing this and doing this and um, doesn't really have much benefit. Um, you end up pushing the ball. Um, people, I think, tend to think that the wrist is what um, makes the ball spin. So um, maybe if um, either you or or Rick can explain what exactly happened, what you're supposed to do as opposed to that. Yeah, um, of course. Um, so I can I can give like the dumb down version. Uh, my dad could probably give more of like, um, you know, the technical terminology behind it. Um, dad, do you want to do the technical? Well, I'll just do it really quick. Uh, I don't, let me see. Again, I'll, I'll back up yeah. a little bit and put this down here. But so Sarah explained, you know, hello elbow. That's just this. You're just kind of pulling and painting your way through this, the zone and you think coming up here and touching your shoulder is something that makes the ball go better, faster, quicker, and it doesn't. The opposite of that would be an internal rotation of the humerus and then a pronation of the forearm and the hand. So it would simply be coming down and rotating or internally rotating the humerus and pronating the forearm. And you get a beautiful, what we call a brush trigger where the inside of your forearm, there, Sarah's got it right there, triggers off your hip and the forearm rolls inward and it stabilizes on your thigh. And uh, it's the natural way that your shoulder, elbow and hand actually are designed to move. So we're proponents of, you know, everybody kind of labels it IR. Well, it's IR, it's pronation, it's a bunch of things, but it certainly is not going to be pushing hello elbow yeah um one of the one one of the biggest things when you're um when you're teaching or practicing the the ir um what we're just discussing um is it it helps emphasize getting your um your arm really close to your body um, and like my dad was saying, creating kind of like brush contact. So, you know, the, the closer your arm is to your body, um, the more consistent you're going to be with location. Um, you can ultimately, you can throw, you should be able to throw faster, you know, um, when your arm is closer to your body, you know, generating, um, more whip snap kind of what he was showing in the video um, when the when the pitcher was coming down, her arm was kind of straightening up or straightening out a little bit instead of keeping that good bend. Um, and so if you're, when, when you're doing the, the internal rotation movement, um, you know, if you're really focusing on the, uh, pronation of the arm, then you will be able to hold that bend in your arm and it won't straighten out as much. And that is what creates the, the whip snap, the force, uh, the speed, you know, the, um, uh, acceleration, I guess, acceleration, of the arm. Yeah. you know, in the pitch. So, yeah. Um, so it helps with speed, but in one of the questions was, what do you work on to improve control? Would you say that that brush trigger also helps with control as well? Yeah, I'll kind yeah. of grab that one because, yeah, uh, that. yeah, it's, um, if I, if I wanted to say three things, what's going to help you improve, uh, control number one, it's your posture. Cause if you don't have good posture, it's hard to get brush trigger. So if you stand up and if you look. If your posture is good, your arm is nice and close to your side. If you stick your butt out like a ninja and lean over, your arm dangles out here in free space. So posture is number one. Uh, I think number two, and these are tied, stability. When you land, you better be strong enough to be stable and not 
flop around, not collapse your leg, not have your hips and shoulders moving when you want to really get them stable. And then tied in there for number two is your brush trigger and the stabilization of the forearm on the thigh. Without brush trigger and forearm stabilization, your location variation will be like, you know, a three foot box. You get your trigger and your arm to stabilize, you're going to hit in a little six inch box every time with your location. So there's your three biggies. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just, I just want to go back and answer a little bit more because um, my dad just mentioned the, you know, getting into the ninja move and that's often taught by getting, creating clearance or sticking your butt out when you pitch. Yeah. Um, and so that's also another biggie that I see a lot. Um, and then also I see, um, I, it's really weird because just recently I've been seeing a lot of girls like do almost a, a hip slide or, um, like an over rotation of the hips, like kind of like they're slamming the door with their hips instead of kind of keeping a 45 and letting the arm come through and you know, get the um, velocity going instead of trying to overdo it or get the. I call it body English. They try to yeah. use body English to throw. Yeah. Rather than letting the arm do the work. Yeah. yeah. To, uh, tr trying to, to overdo it too much because, um, because it f might feel easier. But in actuality, you know, it's, it's, it's really just kind of creating an issue, you know, yeah. um, some, something that might not seem very small in the beginning, but it will be pretty big in the long run. So. All right. Um, I'm going to ask, I think I'm going to uh, skip to the question when Teaching a drop ball compared to a fastball, how do you get your students to get their thumb in front to get 12-6 spin? <laughs> um, and it says, my, my daughter always has tendencies for her pitches to have bullet spin. Um, I don't know if that was the same question there, but um, uh, I think yeah, they, they were, there were two spin, different spin questions. questions. Two different questions, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the answer, at least from my end, would be is um, from the absolute first pitch a kid throws, you know, in theory, they're throwing a fastball. I want to get 12-6 spin immediately. You know, if I hold this split ball up, I want that split right down the middle. And my theory is your fastball should be your drop ball. So why would you teach anything other than this spin on your fastball? So if you get a good fastball, basically you have a good drop ball, okay? And the simplest way to teach it is to say, um, somebody in that question mentioned thumb. Okay, if I went back here and here's my thumb, take this thumb and explode it inward. Explode the thumb in and what'll happen is you'll get right here, the ball will come peeling off the end of your fingers as your thumb explodes in. So either explode the thumb in or you say to yourself, your index finger should actually exit the ball on the outside half of the ball when you're throwing a good drop ball or you're throwing a fastball. If your index finger slides to the inside of the ball, you're gonna get a gyro, you're gonna get a bullet. bullet. Okay, so from, from day one, I'm teaching a kid instantaneously that they need to have this spin right here. Okay, and from day one, uh, every one of my kids is gonna have this kind of a ball in their hand when they're pitching with me. I call it a split ball, it's half red, half yellow, so that we can see what's the spin on the ball. And we're working on 12-6 uh, spin from day one. It, it's a lot easier. For some reason, I know some people think that they should throw a bullet spin on their uh, fastball. For the life of me, I've never figured out why. I've never seen an advantage in it, other than if you don't want your ball to move. <laughs> so there we are. All right. Um... Sarah, what is the one piece of equipment besides a colored plate that you would never do a pitching lesson or workout with? Without. Without. Oops, sorry, I did read that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. Um, okay, so 
This is, uh, this is a great question because the, um, the three things that I'm going to say don't cost any, really any money at all. Um, the first one I would say would be, um, a permanent marker. Um, and I say that because, um, when we were speaking about the pronation of the arm before, um, we do this trick or we, we draw a visual on the young lady's arms um, and that we like to call dot and cover. And it's, a, it's literally a dot and a line on their arm. Um, and so like we would, we would place the dot about right here and then we would you know draw a line on their arm here so that when they come down, they focus and think about making contact with the dot and then covering the line. And so magic marker, permanent marker would be the first one. Um, the second is literally what my dad was just showing with the ball is getting a split ball. So that's not something that he bought. He literally colored the other side of that ball with a permanent marker. And so you could either do it like that or you can get some electrical tape and tape it right down the middle. Um, uh, when I say middle, I mean of a, of a four seam, not actually in the middle because if, if you're, if, you look at a ball and you see the middle, then it's going to be the, going the wrong direction. We want the four seams going down, um, so that yeah. you're practicing. Show that, show that ball again, Dad. Yeah, there you so go. So you, you kind of you there just put the split perpendicular to the four seams. Yeah. yeah. So you, your kid, you, your kid, your parents should all be reading the spin on their fastball and drop ball from day one. Yeah, um, and then. I would also, um, I would also never do a pitching lesson without, um, we call it red line high. Um, when I was younger, my dad literally created this out of a red ribbon. Um, and now we use, um, like a Chinese jump rope, but literally it's, it can just be a piece of elastic, um, in a circular, um, how would you describe it, Dad? Well, it's just, you basically have stretched it between two poles and yeah. you have it about four feet in front of home plate and you put it knee high. And it's a great visual for the kid to learn, here's the height that the ball needs to be when it's going through the hitting zone for any low pitch. And then of course you can raise it up for your rise ball. You can lower it down. You can put it at every different level, but that visual, it also tells you one of the most important things in ball movement. And that is that probably your launch angle or release angle is maybe more important than spin, spin rate, spin axis and everything else. So right. um, anyhow, it's a great visual. Yeah. All right, so um, we got a, a Sharpie, a Chinese jump rope, anything and else? Split ball. Split and ball. a split ball. Split there ball. Yep. Well, the, yep. the, the Sharpie covered the split ball. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rick, do you have anything to add to that? Is there anything else you use? No. The, uh, well, yeah, I do. Yeah. I have one you other. You have tool. lots of stuff. I know. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The clicker. I got my dog <laughs> clicker that, uh, you know, that's positive reinforcement. It's the best way to teach. So, uh, you know, go into our courses and look up the, uh, the clicker training course. Uh, I use I used it tonight on a young lady, yeah, and she was a sophomore in high school. So it's not for little kids; it's for every kid. Yeah, I was gonna say if you want to know more in depth about the dot and cover or the clicker, you guys kids um, check out Rick's uh, courses online at uh, polygirlfastpitch.com. Is that yeah. is that right? Yeah. Did I say that right? That's it. That's yeah. It. All right. A little plug right there. Thank you. Um, Rick, yeah. <laughs> what, what's more effective, a fast curve or a slower one that breaks bigger and later? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Okay. Uh, first of all, 
there's two answers to that. The first answer is that's a pitch calling question. Okay. And uh, there are in pitch calling, if there are only 10 factors in play in a game, and there's usually about 20, if there's only 10 factors in game, do you realize that there's 1,800,000 potential decisions that you could make on a pitch call? That's a fact. Go through the mathematics on it. That's if there's only 10, okay? And there's always more than that. So what's the right pitch to throw to the right hitter, to the right count, to the big hitter, the lefty, you know, you're ahead in the game, you're behind in the game, et cetera. Okay, now let's go back about the uh, curveball itself. Okay, I will tell you, it's been my experience over well, 100 years almost. Um, that, that old? Yeah, that actually it's the fast curve that breaks later and breaks sharper. Okay, so are there advantages in a fast curve? Yeah, it breaks later, so it doesn't give itself away. It breaks sharper, so it's a little bit harder to read. Okay. So that's, those are advantages, okay? A slow curve has advantages also. The slow curve maybe breaks farther because it's in the air longer, so it's got more time to move. So maybe that's an advantage. The slow curve is slow, so it's a different speed and speed is difficult, it's challenging, okay? Um, but then again, a slow curve uh, does give more time for the hitter to react. So I, I think there's a place for both of those pitches in the game. Um, and I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. And uh, I kind of go back to I've, I've, I've never seen a slow curve that breaks later and sharper than a fast curve yet. But I still got a few years left to live before I'll you know, say that's a fact. Okay. Right. Sarah, so what was your favorite pitch and your best pitch and your favorite pitch sequence? Okay, so now that you're retired, you can tell us all your secrets. I can. Yeah, she blew she blew me away <laughs> with her answer on this one. We talked about it today and it surprised yeah, we me. We talked so. about this today, and he was I think I really have him thinking because I don't think he's really ever heard of some of the things that I had to say. Um, okay, so realistically, your best pitch um, should be should be your favorite pitch because it's the, the pitch that you can get um, the most consistent strike or always get a strike with that pitch. Um, so I don't really think that there is a difference between the two, favorite and best. Um, but when I was younger and probably in college, I would say it was my rise ball. Um, I was known for my rise ball. I was a rise ball pitcher. Um, when I started playing internationally, um, it was probably my backdoor curve. And I say that because it was almost like my stun pitch. Uh, the way that I was taught to throw it, if there was a right-handed batter in the box, I was focusing on throwing behind the batter. So it would just briefly come in on into their body um, and finish on that back inside corner it would literally look like it was going to hit them and so they would either a not swing or if they did swing it was kind of like a protection swing so most of the time it was a foul so that's a strike anyway so I either got a called strike or a foul strike um most of the time if if it was hit, it was only hit because I made the mistake on my location. So I didn't, I, I'm, I didn't get it inside enough or um, maybe half the ball caught too much of the, of the uh, meat of the plate. Um, and then, you know what? I never thought that I would say this, but my last season that kind of just finished here in Japan, I would say it was my changeup because everyone really knew me as 
you know, a rise ball and a curveball pitcher. And I kind of like reinvented myself with the changeup. It was working really well. We threw it a ton inside, outside, um, different counts. There were times when we threw it back to back to back. And if you would have told me to do that when I was in college, I would have thought you were crazy. Um, so what, what change that helped you with it, do you think? Yeah, um, I think experience. Um, you know, I, I always tell my kids, uh, you have to throw it in the game in order to see if it works. You have to throw it in the game to see how to use it, to know where to place it, to know what counts to use it in, to know, um, you know, how to throw it for a strike and how to throw it for a ball. And um, I just kept throwing it and I, people didn't know that I could throw a pretty good change up, but, I didn't know that I had a pretty good changeup either, but I just kept throwing it. And so it, you know, I, I know my dad would always tell me, how are you ever going to know if, if it's a good pitch, if you don't use it? Because even, e even if you have, um, you know, uh, an O2 or a one, two count and you throw a changeup in the dirt, somebody will probably still chase that pitch, you know? So once I started doing that and realizing that people, that hitters would still chase that pitch, then I started figuring out that I didn't necessarily have to throw it for a strike every single time. You know, I could, I could use the effectiveness of the off speed um, to still, you know, get a pretty good outcome with it. Um, awesome. Yeah. Um, it, well, I guess it, it shows that you never stop learning and you know, it's yeah. you're never too old to re relearn a pitch, I guess, or reinvent yourself. Yeah. Did you say never, never too old? Was that it? Huh? Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't call you old. You're younger than me. So <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Um, my <laughs> Rick, there was uh, somebody had commented or asked if any other pitchers experienced swelling on the inside of the drag ankle. Um, they said their daughter just finished a 200 pitch tournament and had a golf ball sized knot on the inside of her ankle. Pitching coach says probably too much pressure on the drag foot. Any fixes, exercise, or other suggestions? Yeah, I kind of have uh, a, a dual response on this one too, Jess. Um, <laughs> In our game, uh, I'm going to address the 206 pitches in a tournament. Um, I'm hoping that this was a college girl and not a 12-year-old uh, or 14-year-old, but I'm guessing it probably was. If you think about it, 206 pitches eh, in a weekend, does that sound like too many? Maybe not, but think about this, okay? So she threw 206 pitches in a game. So that means she had some warm-up pitches in between innings, so that's at least another 75 pitches, Okay. And she probably warmed up three different times for three different games because 206 pitches, she probably threw in three different games. So there's another 120 pitches that were pitched in the bullpen that weekend. So you can see those numbers adding up. And I am guessing that young lady probably pitched or practiced at least three times that week before the tournament. So uh, I call it, uh, we, we need to monitor pitch counts. We gotta be careful about overuse syndrome. Uh, okay, so that's one one issue there. The other one would be is, I think I can probably envision what was happening with her foot or her leg. And it has to do with uh, an inefficient drive mechanic. It's kind of that ninja move that Sarah mentioned, or it's a, a forced opening. And when you get what you get with a forced opening is, is your drive leg, which is your drag leg, just lags way behind you. Okay, and the foot drags on the total inside of the shoe, not on the toe where it should be dragging, it's right here. And the ankle just gets, just bent backwards. Okay, because there's so much pressure on that back leg on the drag. So it's really, uh, uh, I've seen that a lot. Okay, and the correction, is there a correction for it? Well, first of all, 
at your drive mechanics, you need to find a way to drive straight ahead and do not force an opening movement. Your opening will happen naturally. Uh, and if that doesn't cure it, which it's pretty hard to cure that, what we call ninja move, we have a little move we call drag on top of toe. And that's, uh, I, I, would, I would credit, uh, if you look at some of the video clips of Amanda Scarborough, who I think was on one of these interviews a week or two ago, Amanda basically drags, her heel goes right over the top of her toe. And when you do that, you minimize the amount of opening of your hips and shoulders. Okay. And so then you get a good drag where in the end, instead of, you don't really end up heel over toe, you end up dragging on the, um, the outside of the big toe and your heel is up off the ground. So minimize the opening of your hips in your opening movement. If your hips are opening up to be in line with uh, home plate and second base, too far. That would be what we call 90 degrees. Your hips should only open to about 70 degrees. Your shoulders can open to 80, but not your hips. And if you do that kind of number, hips 70, shoulders 80, you'll have a real nice forward drive. You'll be up on the inside of your big toe, your heel will be off the ground, and you're not gonna be using that foot as a, uh, you know, a dredge or something like that, uh, which probably happened here. Um, I'm hoping to wrap this up with maybe one more question. Um, I think I'm going to pick uh, Sarah. Why are so many pitchers throwing a rise ball with bullet spin? Don't get her started, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> I, we had this discussion today. Um, how do you feel? How do you really feel about uh, TV announcers <laughs> that? Uh, talk about great rise balls when it's a beautiful uh, bullet spin. Yeah. Um, pitchers who are throwing a rise ball with bullet spin were not taught a proper rise ball because a proper rise ball would never have a bullet spin. Um, the faster you throw a rise ball, the more likely you are to have the fingers um, try to straighten out. Um, and so when, when we are teaching, when I'm throwing um, the rise ball, uh, there's three main keywords that we kind of um, try to really focus on so that uh, the bullet spin is not created. Um, and the first major one would be cup. Um, so if I got my rise ball spin in my hand, um, and I went to, you know, down to release, I would want to make sure that my hand was cupped under the ball. Um, what I've been saying lately is that you want to kind of create um, a wall with your fingers um, because we're so used to throwing drops and fastballs Holding this hand position is very difficult. If you throw hard already, your fingers try to pull down. Okay, gravity starts to take over. Yeah, centripetal force really plays a lot of uh, factor in that uh, pressure of the ball against the fingers. Um, and uh, so if, if you don't really have like a, a great cup, um, it can, it can instantly create, uh, a lazy spin, I guess you'd say. And then another keyword, I guess, um, leading into this would, that we like to use is slice. So, um. If you have a good cup and 
you know, you're thinking about this part of your hand kind of slicing um, towards the catcher. Um, these two things working together, uh, you could get pretty good correct spin. If the slice breaks, which it will, unless you really, really train yourself, um, you will instantly start throwing bullet spin. Um, I mean, you really got to keep a good slice. You got to stay underneath the ball with the cup. Um, you got to keep what's, the ball what's in. The, uh, what's the third one that you say then? You can show it right there too. So you had cup, smile, and or cup, slice. It, I'm sorry, cup, slice. Yeah. And yeah, and then out the back. So out the out back, the back meaning, meaning and um, realizing that the ball goes this way out the back of your hand, you know, not this way. You're not throwing it this way. It's coming out the back of your hand and then um, has the uh, 12 o'clock was what you're looking for, spin rotation or access, I guess you'd say, right, Dad? Well, 12 is the spin direction and the direction, axis would yeah. be, if we have this, the axis is horizontal. Yeah. Right, the horizontal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, backward um, spin. So, yeah, the, the backward spin, almost like, you know, a towel taking a, I, I always try and tell the girls, it's almost like, um, uh, not a towel, what's it called? Um, a tablecloth, like this. Oh, you when know, you pull it out underneath you the- pull uh, it out from underneath all of the dishes. You know, that's the type that. of- because you're spinning under it. Feeling or spinning under that you want to have. Um, obviously, it's it's not it's not like this, you know. So it's you're not, saying like both spins created when they yeah. go too fast, their fingers run forward or the fingers drop down. They don't keep it cupped. They don't slice slice underneath it, and they don't drop it out the backside enough. Correct. They, they basically come forward on it, and that's what creates the bold spin is that their fingers are are forward on that. Correct. All right. Good answer. Um, is there, so we're going to wrap it up unless there's any other questions. I know I skipped a couple that you guys definitely want to answer. Um, is there anything else you guys want to answer on here? No, I don't think so. I think we covered good. quite a bit, unless Sarah had another one. I think no. we're good. I, I think, I think that's pretty good. Um, awesome. Yeah, we, we, we pretty much touched a lot of the questions that were asked. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to wrap it up, but if you guys ha want to, anybody listening wants to check out and have more information, please visit polygirlfastpitch.com, uh, um, or you could probably reach out to Rich, Rick or Sarah um, personally and ask them questions, I'm sure, or yeah. myself if you guys have any questions. Yeah, for sure. All right, thank you guys. Um, thanks thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Yes, thank you You're so welcome. much. And, and a big thank thanks Crystal. to uh, Crystal Brown for helping yeah. coordinate this also. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys later. Thanks, everybody, All for right. attending. Bye now.